Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Uh, today's video is going to be all about the fighter. Um, the fighter was always, in my opinion, one of the more simple classes to play. It was pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, it's the first character that I ever made was a human fighter. Uh, whenever people used to play, uh, when I was teaching them for the first time, I always used to say, you know, it's a good idea, just play a fighter, learn the basics, and kind of go from there. Uh, so even though they're kind of a simple and straightforward class, there's still a little bit of an interesting history behind them. So, you know, I'll go over, uh, you know, like I did with the Druid, just some of the differences in the, the character from the previous editions. So we start with, uh, again, first edition AD&D. And the fighters in this was really the most uh, simplistic class really in the book. I'll see if I can find it. The write-up was, you know, very, very short uh, for the fighter itself. So it starts... It starts here, and it ends there, so it's not even a full half of the page. <clears throat> uh, what was interesting about the fighter, um, back in these days, the way that you would design your characters, you would roll 3d6 for your stats, and you would take them in order that they were rolled. So, you know, depending on how those rolls came up, it kind of dictated what you could do for your character class. The fighter was an easy one to get into because all you had to have was a strength of 9, and you could be a fighter. Whereas things like the Paladin and the Ranger have higher uh, prerequisites and uh, you tend to have to have much higher scores in multiple abilities in order to play any of them. Uh, the Fighter, really, all they really had going for them, you know, they could wear all the armors, they had no limit on magic items and things like that like the Paladin did. Uh, they had D10 for hit dice, which the Ranger didn't have, uh, which I'll get into when I do the video on the Ranger. Uh, but they also had the most weapon proficiencies of any of the classes. <clears throat> now, all the warrior classes, so the fighter, paladin, and ranger, were capable of making multiple attacks. So the only thing that really separated the fighter from everybody else was the fact that it was easiest to, uh, to get into, to qualify for, and it had the most weapon proficiencies and uh, no restrictions on what you could have for magic items, like the paladin did, and you got full d10 hit dice, like the uh, unlike the ranger. So that was kind of the first edition one. In the second edition, AD&D, uh, which is actually the one that I started on, uh, the fighter was pretty much the exact same as it was in first edition, because you know first edition and second edition AD&D wasn't really all that different in terms of what the character classes really got. But uh, one thing that I was able to find in this is that the fighters uh, were able to specialize. So if they spent extra proficiency slots, on their weapons, they could uh, deal extra damage. Um, and that's with the melee weapons. So if you specialize with a ranged weapon, like a bow, for example, uh, you had to spend more slots. So to specialize in a melee weapon, you have to spend one slot to be proficient with the weapon and one to be specialized with it. And if you're specialized, you do an extra two points of damage and your attacks per round went up faster than a non-specialized uh, character or it's not specialized uh, weapon attack. If you specialized with a bow, it was three slots, one to be proficient and two to specialize, and you didn't get any extra bonus damage. Uh, what you got was point blank range, which I believe gave you like a bonus to hit if they're close enough. So the, the archery thing was really underwhelming if, if you were a fighter because you didn't get extra attacks and you didn't do extra damage. But uh, that's basically what the big difference was with, with the fighters from all the other classes is they had the ability to specialize. No other class could specialize. Uh, the Rangers and Paladins, once again in this edition, did get extra attacks at higher levels, but a fighter specialized with his weapon would get more than anybody else and would get multiple attacks much quicker. At first level, you could start with three attacks every two rounds. When we get over to third edition, is this the first time where the fighters actually became somewhat... Um, uh, customizable. In 1st edition and 2nd edition AD&D, it really came down to the only difference between any of your fighters is what weapons they used. Other than that, they played the exact same. So if you didn't like being a fighter who used a sword and shield, you're probably not going to like being a fighter who's using a, you know, great axe. Just, you know, just to, to kind of uh, explain what really what, uh, what it was like back then. With this version of the game, <clears throat> you got access to feats. And the fighters had a ton of feats. They got bonus feats, which were selected from a very special list that uh, was for the fighters only. Uh, as far as 
using their, their bonus feats goes. So they weren't able to take any old feat. They had to choose from a list, but they got a bonus feat at first level, and they got a bonus feat at second level, and every even-numbered level after that. So a fighter, <clears throat> you know, that's in addition to the feats that you get one at first level to begin with, and then one every three levels. So the fighters got a ton of feats. And that's what really kind of set them apart. Um, they have the multiple attacks again, but in this edition, multiple attacks wasn't as special as it was in the previous ones. Because even a cleric could get up to three attacks per round, and a wizard of, of all the classes could still attack twice per round if they were using a melee attack. Not as good as a fighter, mind you, but they still have, you know, all the classes could make multiple attacks. So it really came down to the selection of feats. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, now with that, I um, wasn't a huge fan of it as the edition went on. Um, the feats started to get a little... Basically, you were kind of locked into these long feat trees. If you wanted something like, say, Whirlwind Attack, for example, there was a long list of things that you had to go through in order to get it. Um, and it really felt like, you know, when you were making your first level character, you already had picked out all the feats that you wanted to take off the 20th level. So you always had that pre-built all the way in advance. And I just wasn't necessarily the biggest fan of it as, as it went on. It was definitely nice at first. And I know there's a lot of people that still love it. I just got a bit tired of it as it went on. But that's, you know, my own personal opinion. Now, in 2006, I believe this came out. Um... This is the Book of Nine Swords. This is again for third edition, uh, 3.5 to be precise. And what this was was the first attempt to actually give the fighters something beyond just their normal attacks and even their feats. So this book had uh, maneuvers and stances and things of that nature. Uh, <clears throat> maneuvers could be used a certain number of times per day, and uh, they were basically the equivalent of spells for a, uh, a fighter type of thing. So it was, it was to give them a little bit more diversity. It also kind of paved the way and set the expectations for what the fighter would be like in 4th edition. In 4th edition, the fighters, like all the other classes, had at will, encounter, utility, and daily abilities that they could utilize. Um, so a lot of their abilities, of course, revolved around their weapon attacks, uh, unlike other classes which revolved around, you know, spells or prayers or, you know, things like that. So a lot of the fighters' abilities really revolved around their weapons. One of the nice things about the fighters, unlike a lot of the other classes, is some of their big powerful daily attacks that they could only use once per day uh, had the reliable trait, meaning that if you missed you didn't burn the use of that ability. So you could keep trying it until you actually hit. So you're guaranteed to actually successfully use the ability. It's just a matter of how many attack rolls you have to make. Um, <clears throat> the fighter, uh, this is actually the first edition as well, where the fighter was not proficient in every single suit of armor, which was the case with all the previous versions. They were proficient with everything up to, I believe, scale armor. So if you wanted to wear plate armor, you had to spend one of your feats on it, basically. <clears throat> And in 2010, when d, d Essentials came out, they kind of changed things around a little bit. They got rid of things like the daily abilities for the fighters, because it didn't necessarily make sense that the fighter could only use a particular attack once per day. Um, and instead, they replaced it with a lot of abilities that they just kind of got at different levels. Uh, they still got their at-will powers, and they still had a few encounter and utility powers, <clears throat> but all their abilities were at least encounter, so they never had anything that they could only use once per day. They could use each of their abilities at least once per combat fight, and they got different uh, abilities with every single level uh, if they didn't get attack powers, for example. D&D um, &D Essentials had two different types of fighters, so there was the weapon and shield, like the one-handed weapon and shield fighter, which was more of a... Um, uh, defensive character, so you would draw attacks towards you away from your allies, uh, you excelled at having high armor class and uh, things of that nature, and they were really the the ultimate defensive character, I guess, for D&D for Essentials. And then you had the Slayer uh, fighter type, which was basically the two-handed weapon, bash things until they stop twitching type of character, which, you know, again, worked out really good. I kind of liked the uh, <clears throat> the approaches that they had for the D&D Essentials. Um, over the, uh, the the fourth edition, the basic fourth edition rules, I think that, you know, the fighters made a little bit more sense in this version, I, and I actually really like them. And, of course, now we are up to fifth edition. Uh, once again, the fighters go back to being a more simplistic, basic character that revolves mainly around just hitting things with a weapon. Uh, but they're a little bit more involved than they were, say, in, you know, AD and D, obviously. And even though they don't have the, the array of feats that you can get, like they did in 3rd edition, they still definitely have a lot of options that make them appealing. So I'm just going to go over some of those uh, here now. 
So just give me a moment, I just gotta get to the fighter section. So once again, fighters are back to a d10 hit dice. Um, they are proficient with all armors and shields, uh, simple and martial weapons, and their good saving throws are strength and constitution. So those are the ones that you want to focus on. Uh, these are actually the first characters, uh, the first class in this book that I've done so far that gets a fighting style. And what the fighting style is, is a bonus depending on which style you choose. So archery gives you a plus two bonus to attack rolls that you make with the ranged weapons, so you hit more often if you use the, the archery style. Uh, for defense, you get plus one AC as long as you're wearing armor, so you'll always get a slight, slightly better armor class. Uh, as long as you are um, wearing any type of armor. Uh, the dueling one is you, when wielding a melee weapon in one hand and no other weapons, you gain a plus two damage bonus to, uh, uh, plus two bonus to damage rolls with that weapon. <clears throat> now, the important thing to keep in mind is that you can use a shield with this style. Um, and I'm going to put a link to an FAQ with the, uh, the designers, Mike Merles uh, in particular, who was uh, answering some of the frequently asked questions. And they said that, you know, you can definitely use the, uh, the shield. It's basically just the, uh, uh, you can't hold another weapon. Uh, I believe I have a link to that. Hopefully, if not, uh, I'll see what I can do to find it. Uh, I know I have a link to another one of their abilities I'm going to get to here in a moment, so we'll uh, we'll just keep going here. Uh, with great weapon fighting, when you roll one or two on a damage die uh, for an attack you make with a melee weapon that you are wielding in two hands, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you can re-roll the die. You must use the new result, even if the new result is a roll of a one or a two. Now, once again, they use the word die uh, as in singular. Uh, so I would say if you're doing something like a great sword, you probably only roll one of the dice, but that's up to the DM to call. Um, and that's, you know, again, if you roll a one or a two. Uh, if you're using a versatile weapon like a longsword, for example, you have to be wielding it two-handed to get that ability. Uh, the protection style, uh, fighting style, uh, when, you, <clears throat> when a creature you can see attacks a target other than you within five feet, so if you're adjacent to one of your allies and somebody goes to attack them. You can use your reaction, which you get one reaction around, to impose disadvantage on that attack roll. So you make them have to roll the d20 twice, take the lowest result, and you can do that as long as you have a shield. If you don't have a shield equipped or uh, prepared or readied, then you're not going to be able to use that ability. So if you're fighting with uh, a two-handed weapon, you definitely don't want to take that. And then there's two-up and fighting, which uh, when you engage in two-up and fighting, you can add your strength modifier to the second attack, which ordinarily you can. It's just a straight dice roll. Uh, at first level, you also get second wind, so you have a limited well of stamina. Uh, basically, on your turn, you can use a bonus action to regain 1d10 uh, plus your fighter level and hit dice. So at first level, it'll be a d10 plus 1. Um, you can use this feature, uh, once you use this feature, you have to uh, complete a short or a long rest in order to use it again. So it's kind of something that you want to use, you know, if you're low in a fight and, uh, you know, you're, you don't think you can take a hit on your turn, use that as your bonus action, get a few hit dice back, or hit, hit points back. That's not actually using your hit dice, so you'll still have your hit dice to use at the end of that. Uh, at second level, you get action surge, which allows you to take an additional action. Uh, so that could be an attack action, that could be, you know, dash, um, dodge, you know, all the different types of actions, you get to use this, uh, an additional one uh, on top of your regular actions. Uh, once you use this feature, again, you have to complete a short or long rest, and at 17th level you can use it twice uh, before taking a rest, but you can only use it once on the same turn. So you couldn't, say, use your attack or your action surge to make a full attack make another attack, your normal one, and then use action surge again. You'd have to wait until at least the next round. Where you get multiple attacks at higher levels, if you use action surge to take another attack action, you get all of your attacks. Uh, I thought that would also be important to point out. Uh, and at ninth level, uh, you are indomitable, so you can reroll a saving throw that you fail. If you do so, you must use a new roll, and you can't use the feature again until you complete a long rest. Um, which is always good if you fail that will saving throw or wisdom saving throw at a crucial time, you can try it again. Um, you can use this feature uh, twice between long rest, starting at 13th level and three times uh, at 17th level and beyond. 
So that's the uh, the basic abilities of the fighter. Uh, they also have their martial archetypes, which you get at third level. That's their focus. So I'm going to go over the uh, the first one here in this video, and then part two will be about the uh, the other two options. So the first one is the champion. That's the one that if you had the basic rules downloaded, that's the uh, that's the archetype that comes with it. So I'm just going to go over that. Um, so with the uh, the champion. At third level, you can improve critical, which um, allows you to score a critical hit on a roll of a 19 or 20. Um, at 15th level, it get, you get superior critical, which goes from 18, 19, or 20. Now, again, in something that I'm going to post uh, a link below with the, uh, the questions with uh, Mike Merles, it was asked if the 18 or 19 would constitute an automatic hit or if it's something that it's a critical, if it would hit with bonuses. According to him, it actually is an automatic hit and you do your normal critical damage. Uh, that's based off the information provided at that time. It may have changed. I haven't seen anything to that effect though. So according to the designer, uh, when you get improved and superior critical, if you rolled 18, 19, or 20, uh, 19 or 20 with improved, 18, 19, or 20 with superior, you get an automatic hit. Uh, at 7th level, you add half your proficiency bonus round up, which is in a, uh, sort of unusual because most things are round down, to any strength, dex, or constitution check that you make that you're not already proficient in. So if you're not proficient in acrobatics, for example, with the Remarkable Athlete ability at 7th level, you can add at least half your proficiency bonus to it. Uh, at 10th level, you choose a second fighting style, and it has to be different from the first one that you chose. And at 18th level, you get Survivor. Uh, you attain the pinnacle of resilience in, in battle. At the start of each of your turns, you regain hit points equal to 5 plus your constitution modifier if you have no more than half your hit points left. So if you're above half, you don't get anything. But once you get dropped below half your uh, full hit points, you get 5 plus your con modifier back each round. Uh, you don't gain this benefit if you have zero hit points. So if you get knocked down, you're still knocked down until somebody heals you. So anyway, that's the part one of my video on the uh, the fighter. So a little bit of the uh, again the history, uh, their basic abilities, and I wanted to go over the champion ability or uh, archetype just because it's the one with the the basic rules and uh, it's kind of the most simplistic of the of the three that they have. The other two are the battle master and the eldritch knight, which are going to be the ones that I talk about in part two of the video. So uh, stick around for that. That should be uploaded in the next few days. Uh, and in the meantime, I hope that, you know, you found this video helpful. I'll post the link below with that uh, questionnaire with Mike Merles. I know he at least discusses the uh, critical one. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about, um, I'm not sure if that it mentions the dueling one in it or not uh, with this shield and sword. I know that there is an answer there somewhere, so I'll try to find that if it's not in the same questionnaire. And if I do, I'll post that uh, in a link below as well. Anyway, I'm going to cut this off because I'm starting to lose focus. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, stay tuned for part two, which will be up in the next few days. Thank you, YouTube.